So, um, just waiting for the first slide. Since we're talking about participation, exchange and all this, I would just have a question to you because I was just wondering how many of you are non-architects here? Is there anyone? So, maybe 0.1% or something? Okay. I think that was a point that we made in the morning in the keynote speech as well, that we're talking a lot about all these issues, but it would be nicer to open up the discussion as well. So, today, luckily, gl climate change is not a question anymore. Yeah, We have enough evidence that something is changing with our environment. You can look at the um, little river out here, which is the evidence of probably the most rain in September, in a couple of recent years. You can see last year in Russia where a lot of forest was burning because there was three months, 40 degrees in the country that's actually not used to it. And this just like a more positive evidence that our climate is warming up over the last centuries. And in order to stop this or in order to stick to the two to three degree scenario that will help us for not that all our cities get flooded, we have to reduce our CO2 emissions to zero by 2050. And many, oh, this is also something that is by the European Union signed off, that we minimum have to reduce it by 80%. And um, it seems for many architects that's not a big issue because we kind of like keep on designing like we did ever before. And this little sketch just should uh, visualize how we normally work as architects. So we have this brilliant idea that we usually have in a toilet or in a shower or somewhere else when God is speaking to us. Then we develop further sketches. We develop it a bit, again, in drawings. And then we have the problems. Because nowadays, with all the sustainability requirements, I'm not talking only about environmental sustainability, but also about economical and social sustainability, we're facing problems that did face because it gets much too complex to be solved alone and we're seeking exchange. We're calling our consultants, we're calling other people, but at that stage it's too late. And the result of this is architecture like this. It's efficiency driven by gadgets. Yeah, We're producing something that is not efficient in the first place because sustainability has to really be thought at the beginning, and we're trying to add gadgets to make it sustainable. And also most of the certificates that we know nowadays or have in place all over the world is promoting this gadget-based efficiency. For instance, you will find bicycle racks in towers in Dubai in the parking lots, because that brings you points in the LEED certificate that you get a sustainable building. But actually, the temperatures in Dubai, no one really uses bicycles. And another problem we have in architecture is the way how we designing. So this is um, the winning competition for the Grand Egyptian Museum in 2002, which probably most of you know. Um, I don't want to talk about the design itself, but the way how we decided about this design. The, in the competition, there was 1,575 participants that handed in at the end. So you see the one winning entry before. So if we consider that such a museum needs at least three architects working for one month, we have around 4,671 architects men month for this one design. Yeah, Just in order to make this number a bit more understandable, this is around 10 years, uh, 10 architects working their lifetime, 40 years. This is around 4,671 men months. Yeah? So we're spending 10 lifetimes of architects designing one building. And I'm sure if we would find another way of how to exchange our ideas, the building would have been much more performative and much better. And this way of how we're practicing is leading to something like this, that worldwide, 2% of the architecture is designed actually by us, by architects. Yeah? And if we think that our profession is so important and that we are the ones that can change something, that can help that our society and our environment gets better, I think what we should seeking for is not to have more competition within this 2%, but just imagine we could increase this to 4%.
how much better our environments could be if we really believe in our profession. So these two problems that we're having, of course, there's many more, but I think these two problems we can only kind of get rid of if we think completely different about the way we exchange our ideas and the way we're working. And opposed to the little sketch that I was showing you about the design process, that is something that I would be like to advocate. It's a complete open process where in any design stage we should include everyone who wants to be part in the design process, a kind of complete exchange. Just as a small provocation, I call that here Exchange 2.0. And in order to explain that, I will talk about some projects that um, I was either co-founding or I'm actively working in. One is Architect Tool, which is a, a, I will talk about crowdsourcing. The other one is Cloudscapes. I will talk about crowd governance. Open SimSim that uh, was mentioned already. I will talk about how to communicate actually with people. Then Open Japan, it's a bit more about collaboration and finally about the collective foresight in Future City Lab. So let's start with Architect Tool. Um, this is how our education or now knowledge was passed on usually or until now. A kind of like top down process. You go to university, they look like churches. You have to climb the staircases, pay a lot of money to enter there. And that's actually reality today. Yeah, we don't have the temples of knowledge anymore, but we have the bazaars of knowledge. Because if you ask any architectural student in the world today to make some research, they will go on the internet and look it up. And the problem, or first the, the good point on this is that education and knowledge is not based on geographical positions anymore. You just need an internet access. You can be anywhere in the world. You can listen to the MIT Open Courseware, where you can listen to the physics professors, where you normally would pay $150,000 to attend the classes. But now you can do it anywhere in the world for free. It's just about your own initiative and the access to the internet. The downside to this is when you ask students, for instance, to research something, they come back with something like this. If I ask for for instance, researching digital fabrication, I know already that is the images that I will get because these are the six first pages of Google. And Google had this little O's there, so I call it the, the six Google O's. And I know already before what we get. But the problem is that we're not teaching how to really use bazaars, how to go shopping. Yeah, That is something that I think we have to change in the way how we're exchanging ideas. So. And we know, for instance, Wikipedia in the 10 years of existence, it completely changed the whole profession, the profession of um, the encyclopedia. And um, this is something that we're trying to do with Architect Tool. So basically, build a tool that allows for better research. So this is a crowd, exactly like uh, um, Wikipedia, a crowdsourced information base for architecture. So you have not only... Um, architects and architecture, but the good thing is once you really look into it and you want to make some research, it gives you cross-references. For instance, it references here Russian constructivism with other buildings as well. And it's kind of like a tool that we're developing at the moment, and I think it's important that we kind of like continue that and also like a lot of people participating. So this is, as I told you, crowdsourced. Everyone can just put in their content there. There's no, no one looking what is put online. Then what we're facing more and more is we're putting our data in the clouds. We're living like a global life. We're talking about cloud computing, cloud servers. I was um, participating in the last year Biennale with um, Transolar in order to make this real cloud in the Biennale. And um, we together developed a way how, that, how we can make a project that would last after the Biennale not only being this physical cloud that you can experience there, but also something that would last on, which might be more sustainable. And what we actually wanted to challenge was the usual way how we make decisions, how we have the juries, like in the competition in, in um, Egypt that you saw. So what we wanted to see is re if really a crowd could decide instead of a jury of some experts. 
So what we did, we gathered some experts to a certain topic. The topic was how the skin of our buildings will look in the future, like sustainable building skins. And we had experts like, for instance, Chris Bengel from BMW, who did the Gina car, which is all about rethinking the skin of a car. And we had the crowd on the internet. And we wanted both to decide and see if there's a dramatic difference between how everyone in the world, not only architects and experts decide, and how this so-called professional jury is deciding. And we started the so-called Cloudscapes Award. We had a, um, a first prize of 10,000 US dollars, and people could hand in their ideas. And we wanted that this becomes afterwards a so-called ideas cloud about sustainability in the, in the net. So we asked for very simple ideas where people kind of like just share the first steps of the knowledge so that other people actually can steal it, copy it, and develop it. And this is one example of a project that was handed in. And um, after three months, the competition was running for three months, the surprising thing for us was that actually the crowds were almost deciding in the same way like the jury. So, of course, for us, we had the jury for legal reasons in place because it, there was a lot of money involved, but I think the next step could really be that we think also about architectural competition or urban design competitions where we actually let the people decide and not anymore a small board of experts. It would at least be an experiment worth trying. But the main thing that we achieved was something like this. You see the map of the people that, that were actually participating, clicking on these, um, on the award. And without having any community before, we had a quarter of a million clicks of 132 countries. And if you look at the map, I'm sure there are some of the countries where people never heard about sustainability before. So for us, it was actually the instrumentum of spreading the ideas of sustainability as well. Open SimSim, that was a project that we, uh, we got a call for participating in the Biennale of this project. Um, and what we wanted to see or work towards the aim of opening up architecture, creating open source architecture. And we call 10 practices in the world to say, do you, don't you want to participate with us in it? And uh, we also had the practice from Oslo, Haptic Stocker that were participating with us. And you see, we really collected people from all over the world. And what we asked them, they should do a specific design. Everyone was doing designing a so-called pot. I won't talk in detail about that. But we asked them to really put the transparency on the design process. So every step had to be um, displayed on the internet from the beginning. It's certainly doable to have a kind of a flexible skin where you adjust some sort of uh, flexible PV to it. What about storage? I mean, if you were to have this, this kind of skin generating power, I mean... And we, we also filmed all the team meetings. So this is like uh, Thomas Auer from Transola, a climate um, expert with um, people from Akanchi Studio in New York. And we put all that discussions, everything openly on the internet so that people can really understand and participate also in the design process. And at the Biennale, we had that room where we exhibited in a traditional way architectural models and people could write comments in little sketchbooks next to it. And we had the monitors. Um, talking wow, about um, um, the uh, the process, so we had the videos. But what was more important for us was to look at a new tool, how we could actually communicate with people who might not know 3D programs. So this was um, an installation, an augmented reality installation that was the first mock-up that we did in Berlin. And that was the second room that we had at the Biennale, where actually there was not any more the physical models, but there were the small cards, and you could hold the cards in front of the camera and rotate your 3D model, and anyone could like operate that and actually comment on the design. So it was a way how to how can we make new tools that are as easy to operate as an iPhone or an iPad, for instance, with a real intuitive um, user interface. I guess everyone still remembers this. Incidents, 11th of March this year, where not only a tsunami, but three catastrophes in a row hit Japan. And since we had that um, big uh, group of people participating in Open SimSim already, we said we have to help. We have to kind of find a way how we can help with this network of people all over the world 
um, the people in Japan. And just looking at the numbers, at that time we had half a million of people that were homeless and around 445,000 buildings completely demolished. So of course there is the help needed. But the problem is the kind of like also political geography and also the, um, the cultural geography of Japan. The official, we tried the official way, but people are really afraid of taking help because they are afraid of losing their faith. So it was really hard to approach through NGOs, through the kind of like top-down process because at the beginning we had an idea of creating a kind of like almost forensic map for um, things that were not good in the city where people could participate. But um, quickly we had to drop this idea. But while we developed this, we worked together with some um, computer developers and we asked them, how long does it take you to program that actually? And we thought about, they would tell us three weeks, four weeks, a month or something, but they told us 72 hours. And I asked them, so how do you want to do that in 72 hours? They said, yeah, we do a work sprint. We're meeting for one weekend all together. You organize us some food, some vitamins, some apples, and we just work nonstop 72 hours and we finish that and have fun together. So we said, okay, that, that sounded really cool. So we wanted to start a work sprint with architects, with people all over the world developing ideas for Japan. So it took us some months to organize that, but finally we had 10 cities all over the world and we had around 250 people that we had to organize in this kind of like work sprint. So it was like a big relay. So, and we, we had these cities in different time zones. So how it started, we started this research in Tokyo with the people who were on the site, did the research, they passed on the problem description to Chennai and India and Moscow. People worked there, passed it over to Europe, they passed it over to um, the US, and it went back to um, Japan in one day. And we repeated this for three days, and at the end we generated 99 ideas for post-disaster reconstruction in Japan. And um, Open source design you can see that online. And I'm just showing you a small yeah. video giving the kind of like atmosphere. But I cannot because I'm not there. So all I can do is like join to this event. And this event is so good. To spread projects between different nodes around the world. Hello. Hi. So could, could you please... Tell us a few words about uh, fisheries. Just giving you a bit the spirit that we had like 250 young and old people events. working so all over the world, not only architects. Idea and they, you know, then they are, the, the copycat who does exactly the same, who reproduces, replicates the same idea. And I think, you know, we do live in an interconnected world. We have the technology. Uh, we do speak similar languages, or at least we have English as a common language. And so I think, you know, this is. Um, an area where we can really learn a lot. So, and, and the best thing that I think that we achieved was not that we had this like ideas cloud of 99 ideas that we kind of continue to develop now, but the kind of momentum that we uh, managed in between the people. I mean, we, there's so many people now that really want to keep on working on this, to work, and this is all non-profit, they don't get any money for this, that they want to help and they want to continue this. And we're working now on projects in India as well and in Haiti. And it's kind of really fantastic to see how we can put this kind of like smile on the face of people just by letting them work. And just quickly finish, to finish up <clears throat> the last initiative that we started this year, it's called the Future City Lab. Just want to come quickly back to our first argument. So our goal is to go CO2 neutral by 2050. If you consider that we have a lead time of at least 20 years in urban planning, we don't have any time to really think about that. We have to go and experiment how we can do it, because by now we don't have actually the knowledge for that. This was a summer in 2003. 40,000 Europeans died 
in this summer. This is more than in the earthquake in Japan even. And Meteo France is predicting that by 2050, our usual summer in Europe or in Paris will have the temperature of 2003. Our cities are not built for this climate conditions that we will have. And But we don't have a vision. We don't know how to go CO2 neutral. We don't have the utopian kind of ideas anymore, how our society, our cities will look in the future. And that is actually where we started Future City Lab as a collaboration of different universities all over the world. And um, we started with a, um, a symposium in uh, Sardinia this summer. And uh, we discussed the pre um, future predictions. We discussed several topics. We have 11 universities worldwide at the moment signed in into the program. And actually what it is is an, a platform where students are not working alone anymore, but they're working on the same topic, can exchange the idea, and all the knowledge, everything that they're producing is shared and discussed in between all the universities and also everyone on the internet. So that's just a better version of the platform. We tested it last semester of students in Dessau, so you see kind of some um, future visions for cities, that is for instance Paris. And every student has a topic, here's a topic of water. And then they develop these visions how our cities with a positive vision for the future can look like. We're not claiming that this is right, that it will look like this. Of course the vision will develop as well over the next years, but at least we have to start really thinking about our future. And on the platform you can also, people can comment on the um, on the visions. You can see all the revisions that the students worked on with all the comments and everything. So the whole process is transparent. In parallel we're developing a wiki on sustainable urbanism together with all the participants. And that's where I want to close up because um, kind of exchange for me is is something where we really have to think about knowledge, sustainability, collaboration and also the foresight. We, we can make connections also um, between what happens in Japan and uh, what uh, uh, maybe it will happen in, uh, uh, in Lisbon. We have to take care of the city and we have to develop ideas that uh, concern with this, uh, this area for sure. I think we learn a lot in this, uh, in this platform that we create uh, with uh, all the cities that uh, were working together and uh, I think it will be very useful in the future also for us. And I don't want to advocate here like the technology or the platforms, but I think what is important is, as I understand our practice, we are do lab, so we just do the things and working with people and I think we have the tools in place we don't have an excuse that we don't have some technologies or something. Everything is there. The exchange has to happen in our minds. We have to change the way we really collaborate and share our knowledge for a better future. Thank you very much.